Hey, welcome everybody into the GoTech Garage. Thank you for joining me today. It is good to be back. It's been, a, you know, just a little while. We've been off for what, three months or so, uh, something like that. But as you can see, new things happening. I hope you guys like the new, uh, the new intro piece there with the new logos and new music. Um, watch for changes in that thing. We're gonna be, we're gonna be tweaking that up as the, as the months go along. So today we are working on a 2014 Chevy Malibu that's sitting here behind me. This thing came into me with a uh, ABS light on, red brake light on, uh, traction control light on, stability control message, uh, service brake system message on the dash. Everything is lit up on the dash. This customer actually took the vehicle to another shop, a uh, local chain store, and they told him that it's actually not worth fixing. He's been driving around like this for over a year uh, with no anti-lock brakes, no stability control, none of that stuff, no traction control. Because when those lights are on, those systems are disabled. When there's a failure in the system, we no longer have anti-lock braking, stability control, um, or traction control, okay? So he's been driving around for over a year with that. And in Wisconsin, we definitely like to have our traction control and anti-lock braking with all the, all the snow that we get here. So we're looking at this car today for uh, those different lights on. So before we get uh, too deep into any theory about how the system works. Let's just start off by pulling codes. I'll show you guys what we're currently seeing in the vehicle. So right now I have the key turned on and we'll go ahead and pull codes here on our scanner. And you'll see that we have uh, two C0035s and a C0040. Now, one thing to note when we're working on newer cars, always take a look at your symptom ID uh, or your suffix of the code. So this is symptom ID 18. Symptom ID 0F and symptom ID 0F. So on newer cars, you'll typically find a code related to a specific area, C0035 being our left front wheel speed sensor circuit, but then you'll see different symptoms related to that. That's where that suffix is gonna come in. So we have a, uh, a primary code and then the symptom will point us in the direction, whether that's uh, low signal amplitude or something like that, or uh, signal erratic, something like that. Uh, when I initially did pull these codes, I did have another code in there, and you'll see that uh, come up on the screen in just, uh, just a few minutes when we get into it. So when we're looking at ABS problems on something newer like this, the system is a little bit different. We're using a little bit different style of a sensor than what maybe what we're used to diagnosing, whether that's an inductive AC signal generator type sensor, or a Hall effect style sensor. This is a two wire sensor on here, but it's using what's called magneto resistive technology. So why don't we get into um, what exactly that is in just a second. Just taking a look here at the comments, making sure everything is going smooth. No, uh, no complaints out there. Yep, we got a shiny new shirt on today. Unfortunately guys, I don't have any new t-shirts yet. They're in the works right now, so we're not gonna have any trivia question today. We're not gonna be able to give any shirts away today. I'm sorry, but we are working on getting some new ones. So hopefully by the time we have the next broadcast, I will have some new shirts for you guys. So let's get into talking about this sensor. So we're looking here at a magneto resistive sensor. So this is a little bit different. Our magnet for this sensor is actually attached to the wheel bearing itself. So instead of just using a tone ring like you see on a cam sensor, or crank sensor type of thing where it's attached to the cam or the crank or uh, the tone ring that's on the axle shaft, something like that, where it's just a piece of metal, now we're actually taking a magnetic ring and we're putting it in with the wheel bearing. Okay, so it's a little bit different than what we're used to seeing and that's because our sensor now doesn't actually have that magnet in with the sensor. So this sensor's job is to read the change in the magnetic field as that, as that encoder ring or that tone ring of magnets is spinning around. So these sensors can and are more accurate than a Hall effect sensor. Uh, in fact, this 2014 Malibu can actually set a code at 0.9 miles per hour. Now we've diagnosed other ABS concerns on other GM vehicles, really all vehicles, but GM vehicles in particular in videos on here. And we don't even get response out of the wheel sensors under three to four miles per hour. So this is much more accurate, can pick up at a much lower speed. Another positive of magneto resistive is it doesn't require signal conversion. We're already gonna put out that digital square wave. So there's no need for an AC to DC converter inside of the uh, EBCM, the electronic brake control module. And then lastly, you'll commonly find magneto resistive sensors to be a two wire sensor, okay? Now that's gonna look like this. This is our wiring diagram for our 2014 Malibu. 
you can see all four sensors there are um, going back to the EBCM. So when we're talking digital sensors, Hall Effect or magnetoresistive, there has to be a power going to it because there's a chip that's inside of the sensor itself. So we have to supply it with power and ground and then we have a signal circuit, okay? So we're only we only have two wires here and that's because it's actually tied together internal to the sensor. But let's take a closer look here. This here is telling us we're not dealing with a variable reluctance or inductive style sensor. We're dealing with magnetoresistive. This symbol is important to keep an eye on when you're working on these cars. It does not look like this. That is your inductive style sensor, right? That is your uh, spool of wires that's wrapped around the bobbin that's going to put out our AC signal. This would have a resistance value across it, just like you're diagnosing an old school ABS system. That is not the case with this. This is a digital sensor with a chip inside of it. Resistance will do you no good across this circuit. What we have to do is we want to check, <clears throat> excuse me, we want to check power. We can check ground and we want to check our signal. What's unique about this circuit is we're actually feeding power into one side. So in this case, if we, oops, let's back up here. In this case, we're feeding power in on this circuit. We're feeding power in on this. This is feeding our power in. So we have a power driver inside the PCM and then we're grounding on the other side. So we have two front sensor issues, left front and right front right now, or is what our, what our codes are setting for. So we have power flowing into the sensor here. So if we were to test right here, we're looking at, we should see 12 volts or battery voltage. That's what this sensor is going to require according to the code set criteria for this vehicle. On this side, what's actually interesting about these style sensors, this side is both our ground, as you can see as we trace down the circuit to right here, it's both our ground plus our signal will also ride on that circuit, okay? So if we take our tool, whether that's a lab scope or, I mean you could look it up on a scan tool I guess, but if we're going to take our lab scope and put it into that pin right there, we're going to be able to see our digital signal output actually riding on the ground circuit. Kind of unique, but that's the way these sensors are going to operate. They're attached internal of the sensor. So really an ohm meter to do resistance check and a multimeter just pulling like DC voltage really isn't going to offer us much because that multimeter is going to be averaging this square wave. Our voltage could read low. Um, it's really going to depend on the frequency of the sensor, that kind of thing. So that's the way this circuit's going to operate. If we go ahead, jump to the next slide, I'll show you guys what that encoder actually looks like. Now, this is a press-in wheel bearing, of course. Um, we're dealing with a hub style today. But this press-in bearing, here's our, our encoder ring right here. So right in, oh, let's jump to a color you can see. Right inside of here is where those magnets are. And if we take a piece of material over that to actually look at that magnetic field, you can see the individual the individual magnets as we make our way, our way around this ring, okay? So that's going to manipulate that magnetic field that that sensor is actually reading. Now it's important, it's critical, if you're dealing with a press-in wheel bearing, make sure that that's facing the right direction. If you have this encoder ring facing the wrong way, if it's facing outwards when it's supposed to be inwards, if this end is supposed to be going in first or last, depending on where the sensor is positioned, you put that in wrong, you're going to have no response out of your wheel speed sensor because the sensor is going to pick up on, this, on these magnets right here. So that's a 64 tooth wheel. Um, there also is a 32 tooth wheel. So you can see we have larger magnets and there's fewer of them, half as many. The biggest difference here is going to be the resolution. Okay, so when we spin this, this hub or this wheel bearing around one, res uh, one revolution, we're going to see either 64 changes or we're going to see 32 changes. Okay, so we're actually looking at more times per revolution with the higher resolution, the 64 tooth sensor. So this sensor would actually be more accurate than this one right here because we're looking at it more often during our revolution. All right, so that's the encoder ring. That's actually built into the bearing. In fact, if I grab the bearing that fits in this vehicle, you can see right here is our encoder ring, okay? Sorry, it's a little blurry, but that's our encoder ring on the back side of our hub assembly. All right, 
our sensor for this vehicle really doesn't look all that different from your normal uh, wheel speed sensor. It's maybe a little bit smaller, a little bit more compact, um, but really overall it's not, not all that much different than your, your traditional style uh, wheel speed sensor. The biggest thing again is that it's only, it's only two wires. All right, so again, we're dealing with uh, 35 code, different suffixes, 18 and 0F. 18 means we have a low signal amplitude, 0F we have signal erratic, uh, 0F for our 40 code, our right front is signal erratic. This code here is what I had in there before. It's not pulling the code right now because of course it's not. Uh, that's just the way it works, right? But it is pulling the code when I uh, did my initial scan on this vehicle. So whenever we're diagnosing something, check for TSBs, right? Take those codes, check for TSBs. Right away, I pull a 17NA047 from GM, directly related to the codes that we're storing. We do not have a click or ratchet complaint noise. We don't have that issue, but we do have these codes. Apparently, we can have rust or metal stuck to the encoder ring. Kind of a big deal. We're using magnets in that encoder ring. They can attract metal and get stuck in there. The repair is to clean the surface and retest. Okay, that sounds really, really great, but if we take a peek at the backside of the hub, so right here is the backside of our hub where our axle shaft comes through. Can't really see that encoder ring in there at all, right? I mean, there's like this little shield piece this little shield piece right here that's built onto the axle shaft is kind of blocking our view of our encoder ring. Now on a rear, on a front wheel drive car, the rear bearings, super easy to see. We don't have an axle shaft in the middle, probably really easy to clean. But if that's the case, if we actually have stuff stuck to this thing, you're gonna have to probably at least back the axle shaft out of the way, if not have the bearing or the axle shaft removed to be able to get that nice and clean. So if you're going that far already, it might be wise for your customer or for you to just sell your customer a bearing at that point. Depends on the situation, right? Depends on the mileage. This vehicle's up over 100,000. Um, if I'm going that far into it, I'm gonna tr try to you know, see if the customer wants to put a bearing in. There is another TSB. Oh, let's bring this back. Another TSB for the rear, 16NA348. When dealing with the rear wheel bearings on a front wheel drive vehicle, you're supposed to put this, uh, put this dust cap on. So now we got uh, a problem with stuff sticking to the bearings and the solution, at least on a front wheel drive vehicle, is to put a dust cap over the rear. So the rears should be less prone to failure then over time. I uh, don't know why they didn't put the dust cap on from the factory, but uh, that's something that's supposed to be added. And then we look at the third TSB. This is a note from GM for our code C025E that is suffix 5A. Again, our suffix here is critical. This 5A is critical. That is specific to this TSB. The code may set when we're scanning for codes, okay? But the problem is, or, or I guess the solution is, this is completely normal. Do not replace any parts. So we don't actually have a problem with our vacuum, I think it was like a vacuum, uh, brake booster vacuum sensor. We don't actually have a problem with that. Think of how upset you would be if you're chasing down this vacuum sensor circuit code you know, you're looking at your power ground signal type of stuff all for that circuit to find nothing wrong with it. You maybe even put a sensor in, you still get the code because you never pulled TSBs, you never found out that's completely normal when you're scanning for codes, okay? Always look at your TSBs before you start your repair because it can lead you in a direction that'll save you some time. All right, things to test. Our sensor's gotta have power, it's gotta have ground. So we can check for our 12 volts from our EBCM. Do not use a test light on this circuit. A test light's a great way to verify load on a circuit that can handle it. This circuit is PCM driven. We're not driving any sort of load. We're not creating a heater off for an O2 sensor. We're not turning a pump on. We're not doing any work. All we're doing is monitoring a magnetic ring. So our current values for this circuit are incredibly low. It's possible that our test light which is what, about, two, uh, about 250 milliamps, right? Or 0.25 amps. It's possible that, that that quarter of an amp for our incandescent bulb test light could actually overcome the current limit for that circuit and burn up the driver inside of the PCM. That would be a bad day. Do not use an incandescent test light on here unless you've 
somehow already verified that it's going to work. Now, maybe an LED test light would be okay here, but again, if you're going that far into it, you're better off just throwing the scope on it. It's a digital circuit, back probe it, throw a scope on it, make it function, see if it works. It's going to be our easiest way. Um, <clears throat> ground on the other side of the pin, again, no test lights. Is our EBCM able to read properly? That's always the question, right? Is our sensor functional? Is our magnetic ring functional? Is our module functional? Do we have a problem getting the signal to the module or do we have a problem actually inside the brain box displaying that to whoever's asking for it? Maybe the PCM or the transmission controller or whatever it is. Is there a problem internal of that? Now, judging by our codes, we're probably just dealing with a sensor circuit issue, a sensor issue or a bearing uh, encoder ring issue. But you never want to um, discount this. You don't want to forget about this aspect of it because it could cause you some problems. Now in a video I did on a old school Alero where I actually had a harness issue, they were super common, right? Where the harnesses have to get replaced. You can take a known good wheel, pin that signal out to your faulty side harness and spin that known good wheel and sensor to drive into the harness for the wheel that's problematic. So in this case, we could take our right rear wheel, take some jumper leads from that sensor, from the signal, uh, the signal from that sensor from the right rear, run those jumper leads up to the harness side of our right front, spin the right rear wheel. On a scanner, we should see the right front react. It should do something. If that's the case, we know that the harness from that connection point all the way to the EBCM and the EBCM is okay. So it's just a quick way that we can verify the rest of the circuit. Uh, lastly, resisting testing, resistance testing is pretty much pointless on these. Okay, don't even bother uh, checking resistance across the two terminals because it's not going to give you anything that's useful in this situation. And I think that was it for this part. Yep. All right. So let's head back over to the car and we're going to go ahead and start off with what's going to be easiest. So we already pulled codes. Say we're still sitting in the car at this point. Maybe we go for a test drive. Maybe the car's up on the hoist like this one. We can look at data. We can pull some data and see what those sensors are actually doing. Uh, as that's loading, I'm going to take a quick second, just take a peek at our comments, see how everybody's doing. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. I, you know, Glenn, maybe I could draw football plays during the next Monday Night Football. That'd be, that'd be kind of fun. Um, that would be, that would be good. It'd be a lot of fun. All right, not missing anything. Everybody's getting a nice clear signal from us. <sighs> Gray camo yoga pants. Yeah, that'd be, that would be ideal. All right. All right. Uh, Cuba, your, your question with the micro ohms and stuff there, when, what we're actually, what we'd be reading is we'd be reading the chip that's inside of there and the chip may vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. There might be one manufacturer that has uh, one chip, another manufacturer that has another chip. They could have different values reading the resistance of them, but the output value could be the same because we're basically measuring a small uh, IC or small chip the values really aren't going to give us anything what we're looking for. The signal could be and, and has to be the same from both chips, even though the resistance values or the way they even function could be different um, inside of them. So resistance testing really isn't going to offer us anything on this circuit. And that's why you'll never find a resistance spec for a, uh, a digital sensor like this. There's just no point in it because we're reading a small, uh, a small IC at that point. Okay. All right, um, so we got the scan tool up and we got a bunch of data up on the screen. Um, really not a lot of it is going to be relevant to what we're looking at. What we're really looking at right now is our wheel speed sensors. That's the codes that we're getting. So I'm going to grab a custom graph. We'll deselect everybody and then we'll just grab our four wheel speed sensors. We'll throw it in graph view. Beautiful. Okay, so because this is a front wheel drive car, I can only spin the two front wheels. Uh, with the engine. So I'm going to go ahead and we'll fire this thing up, drop it in drive. Of course, it's already on the hoist. It's safe. It's not going anywhere. Um, you could do this in a test drive as well. So we'll go ahead and fire up. 
And there we go, drop it in the drive. So our front wheels are spinning. And we're getting a response. So this tells me we're seeing something out of our sensor itself. We're seeing something out of our EBCM itself. It's responding, it's doing something. Looks like there we hit over 20 miles an hour at one point. But it's kind of weird how the signal is, is dropping back to zero like that. Is that normal? Is that not normal on this specific vehicle? I guess we don't really know at this point because the only wheels that we can spin right now are the two front ones. So I'm gonna go over to the right rear and give that wheel a spin and see what we can see and see if that's a normal for that to drop out. So I'm spinning this thing about as fast as I can by hand. I didn't eat my Wheaties this morning, so I don't think I can get it going very fast. But no dropouts, right? That is looking more normal. That is what I would expect to see out of a wheel speed sensor circuit. So a quick little verification like that is telling me we got an issue. I don't think that's normal for those to be dropping in and out like that. Doesn't seem right. Now what? Now we got to figure out how we're going to test that circuit. Again, digital circuit, easiest way is going to be to throw a lab scope on it and look at our actual signal. Uh, let me shut this off quick. We'll talk through setup of the scope. All right. <clears throat> so our scan tools is, is a vital tool for this. I mean, really, that tells me that we're looking at issues on both front sensors and it's not normal looking, but it's showing us that we're able to display a signal even if it's ugly. So we're getting something out of our sensors. Yes, Glenn, you're right, we could bust out the jumper wires and um, go from a rear sensor, that would work as well. I've already hooked up the lab scope, so my goal today was to save a little bit of time because we're gonna have a little bit of repair on here today. I wanna show you guys the actual fix. Um, so, oh. Voltage drop diagnostics. I'm glad you popped in as well. Good to see you here uh, with the, I know it's kind of odd when you get a notification from a channel that you don't really know the name, but glad you are here. Um, so got the lab scope hooked up. I've already um, set everything. All four channels are currently hooked up. I got them labeled here at the bottom. So we're looking at magneto resistive sensors. Channel A or blue trace is going to be the right front wheel speed sensor. Channel B, left front wheel speed sensor. Channel C, right rear wheel speed sensor, and channel D is going to be our 12 volt power in. So if we go back to here, where we're actually hooked up right now is we're hooked into the ground side on each sensor, okay? And then, and then we're, go back to the good old screen. So we're hooked in right here, we're hooked in right here, we're hooked in right here, and then just because we can, we have a fourth channel, we're hooked in here checking for 12 volts. So we're looking for digital signals out of all three of these here. These should all be digital signals, and we're looking for steady 12 volts out of that guy right there. So let's take and see what we've got. Now, I did leave this at 12 volts on our scaling here, okay? I left it at 12 volts. Let me, let me clear this out quick, sorry. I did leave this scaling at 12 volts because we don't really know right now what level the voltage is supposed to be for our signal, right? Now I did out on Identifix see somebody had posted a procedure where you can take the power wire going in and take a fuse jumper wire, jump that over to the ground side and uh, tap it repeatedly to get like a square wave basically going into the EBCM. You're shoving that 12 volts into there. Again, it's a current limited circuit. It's inside the EBCM. It's being driven by the EBCM, but I don't know if that's exactly safe. We don't even know what voltage level the circuit's supposed to put out yet in a known good. So I don't think I would go jumping any circuits together until we at least know what we're looking at. So that's why my scaling's all at 20 volts, so I can make sure to grab, um, grab that 12 volt, <clears throat> grab that 12 volts if it is truly a 12 volt square wave. But Typically speaking, it's pretty rare that we actually see a true 12 volt square wave. And of course, I locked the door. That's why we always roll down the window, right? All right, let's fire this thing back up. 
drop it back into drive, and let's see what we got. All right, ah, we're getting signal, but we're not getting anything even close to 12 volts. So let's go ahead, bring our voltage in. So both front sensors are outputting between zero roughly and almost negative a volt. Okay, that's fine. We're seeing something. We don't see anything out of the rear right now because obviously the rear is not spinning. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna drop that one to the same signal. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is we'll go and give that, uh, give that wheel a spin after I set this back to where it was. There we go. <clears throat> give this wheel a spin, then we'll pause the scope and take a look. All right. Let's see what we've got. So we're going to go ahead and zoom in on this. Oh, that's interesting. The rear is hitting channel overage for some reason. I wonder if my lead is falling out maybe. Let's try that again. go so you guys can see right off the bat that our red channel is like it almost looks intermittent right blue it's kind of a mess let's zoom in on that one and see what we've got I don't even think blue is connected right now all right So let's bring up our green. Well, that's a nice square wave. Let's get these guys out of the way. So our, our right rear right now is giving us a beautiful square wave. Looks great. I don't see any dropouts. Looks perfectly consistent. And then as the wheel speeds up or slows down, you'll actually see the time spent high or low increases or, or decreases depending on wheel speed. So that looks great. Right rear, fantastic. Uh, left front, doesn't look like it's really doing much here. I might have a bad connection there. We'll check that in a second. Sorry, that was right front. Blue is right front, right? Yep, blue is right front. And then let's take a look at red. Get this out of the way, get this out of the way. Red is kind of looking weird, right? Not normal, looks like we have some, some signal. Yeah, it looks like a nice square wave. Then it drops out, nice square wave, drops out, nice square wave, drops out, okay. Interesting, let's uh, see if we can fix that blue signal, see if we can get it to look normal. Again, I've already pinned this out at the connector that's underneath the car. Let's see if that works. <clears throat> Isn't that interesting? Where'd my blue channel go? All right, so still have nothing on my blue channel. What's going on here? Oh, all right. So if you want to get a signal out of a wheel speed sensor, the wheel has to actually be spinning. Go figure. So if for some reason, the torque was all being applied to the left front, not the right front. Duh. All right, there's a moment for live on camera, right? I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to speed this thing up just a little bit. And again, the door locked. What the heck? Let's see what we can get here. All right, so that's about 20, there's 30. That should be good. Hopefully both wheels started spinning. 
All right, cool. So both wheels were spinning. And again, we're looking at very uh, repetitive um, signal here. On our right rear, it was completely consistent. I'm gonna shut this thing off. Then I don't have to talk over it. Our right rear is perfectly consist a perfectly consistent square wave. No issues in the right rear signal. It was doing exactly what it's supposed to. Our two front sensors appear to be dropping out. And if we look, if we look close and we start to analyze like a consistent portion here, obviously there's gonna be some changes as wheel speed itself changes, but we'll look at this pattern right here because it looks pretty consistent. Looks repetitive, right? Signal, no signal, signal, no signal. And if we actually take our cursor, let's measure the point where we have no output. Uh, what just happened? Back up. So the point where we have no output, we're looking at about 80 milliseconds, we'll call it. And we'll go here. And again, 80 milliseconds. Again, 80 milliseconds. So it's repetitive. It's repeating over and over and over again. We get a signal, we lose it. We get a signal, we lose it. We get a signal, we lose it. This, from a little bit of experience in dealing with this kind of stuff, isn't really making me think that I have a sensor issue. A sensor typically is not going to uh, consistently fail in a repeatable manner. This is looking very repeatable at this point. Like we have an issue either with the... Um, either rust stuck to the encoder ring like that TSB said, or we actually just have an issue with that encoder ring. Every time that thing spins around, we lose a signal, we gain a signal. We lose a signal, we gain a signal. Something is going on there. And it actually looks like our left front is doing about the same. And if we, if we measure that as well in a spot that we're lo our signal's lost, 33 millisecond dropout, 30, five second millise millisecond dropout. So pretty consistent there as well. And this, this little one right here is repeatable as well. So really we're looking at signal that for some reason is, is dropping out. And most likely that's gonna be caused by that encoder ring or that tone ring on the back side. Now, guys, you can apply this thought to any sensor that you're looking at. If you're looking for, or if you're looking for a signal issue and it's repeatable like this, there's a high probability you're looking for something off uh, of an error of what that sensor is reading, whether this is for crank sensor, cam sensor, anything like that. If you see a repeatable thing over and over and over again that goes with the revolution of whatever component it is, you're probably looking at whatever that sensor is reading off of, rather than it being like a connection issue or something where I wiggle the harness and see a failure. I didn't touch anything here at all, and it's being completely consistent. So I think we're looking at an issue with the encoder ring, with that magnetic ring that's on the back side of our hub. Does that kind of make sense of how we can analyze that very quickly using the scope, taking a look at our known good? This also is a perfect reason as to why the scan tool will report, drop out, report, drop out, report, drop out. Because as we, as we look here, I think it's probably safe to assume that this would be considered one revolution. So we have signal, it drops out. When we start signal again, that's gonna be the next revolution of that sensor. So the computer's gonna look at the time or the frequency of that sensor to be able to judge what that wheel speed is. And at that point, we're able to, um, we're able to see that. But the, this time where it sits low like this, when we're, when we're circuit low, that right there is going to be responding back to the computer a zero. So that's probably why we're seeing it respond eight miles an hour, zero, eight miles an hour, zero, nine miles an hour, zero, nine miles an hour, zero. That's why it's going high to low on our scan tool as well as our, as well as our scope. We're looking at individual revolutions on here. We're looking at a consistent uh, rotating uh, wheel on our scan tool in a much greater amount of time. So I think it's safe to say that we're going to have to look at the backside, <clears throat> backside of this bearing. Makes sense, any questions? Mm -hmm. uh, Frank, would these dropouts cause unrelated ABS activation? In this case, no, because in this situation, 
this is set in ABS light. So as soon as that ABS light was illuminated on the dash, that red brake lights to build a track traction uh, control, all those lights, as soon as those were put on the dash, ABS is turned off. So we're not going to see false activation on this vehicle because the circuit has a failure, because the computer has recognized there's a failure in the circuit. So no, uh, no unwanted ABS on this one. Um, wrong bearing, let's see if it's shiny and new. Um, yes, ABS is disabled. Uh, the bearings look original. Again, this guy's been driving around with this problem for over a year. He has had nothing done to it since it was looked at by a, a local chain store over a year ago where they said, don't bother fixing it. So um, he's been driving around like this. So I think at this point, let's get into this uh, right front hub and take a look at what, we've, at what we can see. Go ahead and throw this thing Make sure the battery doesn't end up dead as we're doing this. All right, key is off. Um, Scott, that's going to all depend on, his question is how are we going to know which vehicles will disable ABS and which won't? That's going to all depend on the system and the EBCM that's in that system. I think that looks pretty good. Um, so typically on a modern car, when there's a failure in the ABS system, it's able to pick it up pretty quickly and go ahead and disable that. Older cars, we've done videos already on like old GM trucks were great for uh, issues with that false activation. They would drop out the signal, the signal would come back type of thing. They weren't as efficient in picking up an error in that system, so it wouldn't set that, that light on. Newer cars typically um, are, are much faster, much more efficient at setting an error. So I would say on a newer vehicle, you're going to be much more prone to have the system disabled and have much less chance of a, of a false activation. Uh, Glenn, that's true. Anytime the light's on, it won't activate. It's the same with SRS. That's pretty true with SRS, and that depends on if you have uh, a system that's going to run isolated SRS, so drivers or passenger side may be isolated from each other. I guess it's possible in some systems you could have an airbag light on for a passenger side complaint. The driver's side still may work. It just depends on way, the way that system's going to work, and you would have to, have to look into, into that system. All right, so we're going to get into getting to the back side of this bearing, so really our best bet here is that we're going to have to, uh, we're going to just probably have to pull this bearing out to be able to take a look. So we'll stick this guy underneath so you can see the back side of what we're looking at. There we go. And we're going to start by taking out our brake caliper bracket bolts. We don't have to take the caliper itself off. The brakes on here are a little bit low. Um, the customer doesn't want to put brakes on right now because there is some life left, but we're going to leave those alone. We'll pull our bearing out. And again, you can see right here that we have this shield piece that's on the axle shaft. So I can't really see inside of there and see my encoder ring on the back side there. So let's get this uh, caliper bracket off and then we'll start getting in on our bearing, getting our bearing out so we can take a peek at it. Now, according to the service procedure, guys, these bolts right here, caliper bracket bolts, these two guys right here, one-time use only, according to our service procedure. So I got new bolts for the caliper bracket. Hub bolts are the same way. This vehicle actually runs what's called torque to yield bolts. So if we look at the service procedure, you're going to see here we have a first pass, final pass. All right, these are torque to yield, meaning the bolt stretches to hold this bearing in. Do not reuse the hub bolts no matter what. All right, follow your service procedure. So we have to torque that bearing down later to 74 foot-pounds with a 60 to 75 degree final pass. Okay, torque to yield. Never reuse a torque to yield bolt. It could snap, you could have failure, you could end up wrecking something, hurting somebody type of thing. Okay, keep that in mind. That's where it really comes helpful to uh, <laughs> read, your, read your service procedure. All right, back to getting this thing out. 
do, 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 just press our caliper back or our piston back a little bit to make it easier getting off. Don't ever let your caliper hang from the hose. It can damage the hose. You can get these really nice little S-shaped hooks or you can use mechanics wire, whatever you want to use. I like the S-shaped hook because it just lets me hang it up there on the spring. Gets it out of the way so I don't have to, to worry about wrecking that hose. Oh, fingers crossed our little rotor, rotor screw comes out. Nice. That was nice. It's nice when those come out. Too often here in Wisconsin we have an issue getting those out. All right. Rare. The rotor's coming off like without a hammer. Um, it almost looks like there's some lube or something on there already which wouldn't be on there from the factory. It's possible that brakes have been done on here already. The car's over 100,000 miles. Uh, the brakes still have life left, so they're not original. So it's possible this thing's had brakes. Uh, brakes done in it, on it already. But the hub, hard to tell, probably looks original. Really no way of knowing, especially in Wisconsin winters. After one or two winters, it could end up, end up looking like this. We have some corrosion and the aluminum on here, nothing too serious. Can't really tell anything out of the ordinary right now. So let's go ahead and get those. Uh, we'll start with actually, we'll get the axle shaft unbolted first. Make sure we can get that loose. That's loud. Sorry to everyone's eardrums on that. All right, axle shaft nut also, also supposed to be replaced. We got a new one of those to go on today as well. According to service procedure, it says to replace. Uh, shaft is seized up in the bearing. Now there's a lot of different ways to, um, to get the axle shaft loose from the hub assembly itself. It's sitting on splines in there. There's a lot of different ways. I like taking uh, a pointed bit with my air hammer and hitting right in the center of the shaft. It's got a little divot in there fits that pointed bit really nicely. Typically that's enough to get that axle shaft pushed back. There's pullers or, or presses out there that you can use or pullers you can use. Some people will take the nut that's supposed to be being replaced anyway. They'll thread that on. They'll hit that with a hammer. You just don't want to hit the axle shaft itself with a hammer. You don't want to, you don't want to pee in over those threads. Otherwise you could end up having to rethread the axle shaft or replace the axle shaft if you damage it bad enough. Um, you don't want to cause any damage to that. So. Um, note to self, always make sure the air chuck and your air tools uh, fit properly with each other. I think this little add-on hose right here still doesn't function. Rut row. Okay, guess we're gonna try the uh, the nut on the axle shaft and hope for the best. I guess that's what we get for relying on air. We need a, a battery operated hammer at this point. Wow, that wasn't so bad. It's loose already, so it's still in in the, uh, the hub assembly, it's still in there because we can't take it out until we get the hub you know, unbolted and we pull the hub off. But uh, the axle shaft is, was, is now able to be moved. So it actually wasn't, uh, fortunately wasn't seized up too tight in there. Uh, let's see if we can kind of take a peek inside of there now. I don't know, oh yeah, we can kind of see in there. Um, Oh, that's kind of cool. So I can actually see the encoder ring now. You guys probably can't. Let's see here. Nah, I don't think you'll be able to see it. Nah, can't really see it. But what I can see in there is the actual magnetic ring is MIA. Um, there's a section of it in there that's still there, and I can definitely make that out. But there's also a section in there that's just uh, com completely missing. So uh, for some reason, it's just uh, it's broken away. 
All right, let's see if we can get these bolts out. And again, torque to yield bolts. They don't really look all that different. I don't know if I'm maybe able to get this one out. Oh, there we go. Uh, they don't look all that different. Let's pull that overlay down. They don't look different. Um, two things. One, the bottom side of the washer here actually has some grooves cut in it. Maybe you can make those out. And the other thing to notice, typically a wheel bearing bolt, in my experience, has Loctite on it, just like our brake caliper bracket bolt has Loctite on it from the factory. No Loctite on this guy, okay? So keep that in mind. If you're pulling a hub bolt or uh, wheel bearing bolt out, no Loctite on it from the factory, it's possible that's a torque to yield bolt. Take a look at your service info and see if you have to, again, have to replace that bolt. You don't you reuse torque to yield bolts. It's a big safety issue. All right, so getting the top one out right now. No way that's a Wisconsin car. I don't, I don't know if, it, uh, if it's lived in Wisconsin its whole life or not, but so far everything's coming off pretty nice. <laughs> Let's spin this back the other way now so I can gain access to the third and final bolt. And we'll see what we got. We'll see if this thing comes out in one piece or if the hub Sometimes the, the bearings themselves will kind of split apart when you remove them. <laughs> we definitely did not, did not ship this thing in from Arizona. This, uh, this actually is a fellow employee here who started here not too long ago. All right, so let's grab our hammer. Make sure our axle shaft is fully separated. All right, so now there's nothing holding our hub in. The actual shaft has been separated from the center of the bearing. Now it should spin it back the other way. We should be able to just should be able to just pop it out. Did anybody hear that? The engine just spun over one time when I, that's gotta be a freak thing. Is the key still in the ignition? Does this thing have like some random remote start on it or something? Yeah, key's in the ignition. Wait, that's weird. I don't like that. Um, all right. All right, so we've already got it separated on this side. The other side looks to be impossible to separate because we got this good old brake shield in the way, but it has moved. Um, normally you could maybe use your air hammer here, but since I never actually verified that my air hammer can hook up to the shop air, that's going to leave me stranded today. So let's get out the old, the old slide hammer. We're going to attach this onto the hub, like so. Throw a couple of lug nuts on there and hope for the best. You guys that are down south, out west, you know, where you don't have to deal with rust and stuff, do these things just come out like, like butter or, I mean, or do they come out kind of hard there too? I would assume, 
that no matter what, there's always going to be some rust and corrosion buildup, but they got to come out easier than they do here, right? So how many times have you uh, grabbed the end of the slide hammer, you know, on the other side of this ball and pinched your hand in there? Never feels good, right? Oh, it's hard to tell if it's moving. Yeah, the brake shield's loose. That's a good start. There goes a the brake pad. Now I promised before doing this to myself that I uh, wouldn't curse on camera. So hopefully we can, we can keep that up at this point. Oh, she's coming out. Feels like it's binding up. So I got I got the right side here. Uh, I don't know if you can tell. Shield's loose on that side. The left side is still kind of bound up. So what I'm going to do now? I'm going to put the hub bolt. Try to see if it'll thread in. Uh, it doesn't appear like it wants to thread in anymore. So I must have it tweaked too much that I can't get this threaded in. But what you could do is thread this bolt in and then hit on that bolt since it's getting replaced anyway. Hit on that bolt and uh, force that thing out. Let's, um, all right. I'm going to swap out air chucks quick and use the old air hammer. See what I got for size. All right. So we're going to try to get uh, the uh, big ski. <laughs> I'm not even going to respond to that name, but uh, asking about why I'm hitting it on one side, the shield and the hub assembly itself are anchored in there tight. So you can't, you can't hit it on the other side. You can't get the shield all the way to hit it on the other side. Spinning the wheel is only going to spin, spin the outer piece. It's not actually spinning the piece that's seized up in the knuckle itself. It would only happen live, right guys? I do need Big Nasty, Eddie. I do need Big Nasty. I don't know if Eric would have this out by now or not. Hard to say. I have seen a video where he had a fun time getting a hub out of a, what was it, like a Chevy truck or something, uh, where he had a fun time with that. Sometimes they just, they just don't come out nice. It's just part of the territory here in, in Wisconsin. You just kind of learn to deal with it. And hopefully we can get this thing out on camera today without having to use a torch. But I guess we'll see 
here in a second. Unfortunately, guys, I'm sorry that I didn't check ahead of time to make sure my air hammer would attach up to our air hose. That's just unfortunate. Yeah, the hub grappler might work, Steve. Um, unfortunately, I don't, I don't have a hub grappler. All right, should be good enough. You mind turning the audio down so I don't blow people's eardrums out with this thing? All right, yeah, safety glasses. Thank you, Glenn. As you can see, I got mine on. Safety glasses when you're playing with the air hammer. Um, all right, let's see if we can pound on the back side of the bearing here on this bolt. See if we can force it out. I saw movement. All right. Of course, now the bolt's holding it in. We will triumph. All right, so as you can see, the bearing's obviously loose now. It's stuck in the axle shaft. Not a big deal, we just got to get the puller out of the way. Wrong size socket. All right, so pullers out of the way. Now we just gotta free up the hub assembly from our uh, from our axle shaft there. Again, it's gonna get loud for a second. Give me the thumbs up. And there we go. So what's kind of cool, what I like about these hub assemblies, you don't have a wire to worry about, you know, compared to old Old GM hub assemblies or a lot of hub assemblies, you got a you got a wire that you know it's all one unit. This one, the sensor can stay in place as long as you're careful, and you don't have to uh, don't have to worry about it. So there's a problem. Uh, magnetic ring, Ooh, magnetic ring. Half of it is MIA. Okay, um, we'll grab this. Where did that go? So this is just a little piece of, piece of something that reads the magnetic field. So you'll see, there's our magnetic ring. All right, and up here, we got nothing. So that there's our problem. I would assume the other side probably looks the same. Now, when I was looking at this thing initially before today, um, the customer did tell me something which bothered me a little bit. He told me that somebody, he didn't mention who, but somebody had put front brakes in this thing. Which is good, right? You know, somebody puts front brakes in, that's great. You know, it's a hundred plus thousand mile vehicle. It's needed at least one brake change already. But he said that ever since, ever, right, ever since, ever since the brakes were put in this vehicle, the ABS light's been on. Now, obviously there's a story to share here and not every situation is gonna be this way. That's why I didn't explain it ahead of time. Not every situation will be this way, but it is very, very likely that a brake change on this vehicle caused our failure of our encoder ring on the backside of the hub. The reasoning being, if the rotor were stuck on there, just like our hub was stuck on there, if it's stuck in place and you're beating on it with a hammer, you could break that magnetic ring off the backside of your hub. Okay, so you've got to be really careful on something like this. Now, I don't know for a fact if this is just a failure of 
this specific model for GMs? I mean, we saw TSBs related to this problem. Are we seeing other vehicles with magnetic encoder rings on the backside of the hubs breaking when people are having to uh, just pound the heck out of brake rotors to get them off? Has anybody else seen this happen before? Um, Jeez, <laughs> that is not the case, Oz. Yeah, so you're right. I think, I think they must have had a hard time pulling the rotors and hammered them to death. That's my guess on here. I don't know that for a fact. But I, all, I, all I know is what's in front of me, and that's that the encoder ring was damaged. Somehow, it's missing half of the ring. Now, I don't know. It kind of looks like the new hub assembly is maybe a little bit better integrated. There's a, just a little bit difference in the way these two, hello, the way these two look. Um, there seems to be less of an air gap with the encoder ring on the new one as there was on the old one. There's some air gap around the, around the sides of it um, between the, the center and the ring itself. So maybe this new hub assembly has been, has been redesigned in some manner, I'm not sure. Either way, this is not a sensor failure. The sensor on this vehicle is doing doing exactly what it's supposed to do. It's, it's not a sensor issue. We're dealing with uh, an encoder ring issue. And is it the fault of the person who changed the brakes? Maybe, but how often do we have to pound rotors off, especially with us in the salt belt? We're always having to, to mash on, on brake rotors uh, to get them off up here. I mean, there's been rotors and drums that we've actually had to cut off with a torch just to get them off of vehicles here. So it just kind of comes with the territory. And if if, uh, if an encoder ring is failing at that aspect, it kind of is, is no good. Um, because, you guys can't see in here, but because the sensor doesn't have a magnet in it, there's no magnet in the sensor at all, because it doesn't, it looks actually really good. It's just perfect looking plastic. Looks just like the new one, the new one does. So uh, there's really nothing that we have to clean off with it because it doesn't have a magnet on it. It's not stuck with a bunch of stuff on it on this thing. So we're going to go ahead and clean up our surface here and get ready to put the new, the new hub in. Should have worn a dust mask. It's wise to wear a dust mask or just don't breathe when you're doing that part. <laughs> if it's going to happen, it's going to happen live, guys. That's not supposed to do that. Let's try that again. All right. That's why we got the file out ahead of time. We'll give that a shot. So we got a lot of corrosion built up in here. So this is actually what binds up the bearing on these vehicles. There's this surface that's in here. So what we'll do is we'll clean as much of the rust and corrosion out as we can. We'll put some anti-seize on it. And it should be good for the next time this has to get done. Because bearings don't last forever, especially up here in the rust belt. You guys might be able to see all the stuff that's just falling out of here. When you're cleaning this, be careful of the sensor. You could take the sensor out at this point. That wouldn't be a bad idea. Pretty good. Yeah, much easier to do on a rear wheel bearing. Too bad this car didn't have a rear wheel bearing failure. That would have been more fun live because it would have been easier, quicker. Uh, but that's just the way it goes. So we're going to take some anti-seize. Try not to turn in the Tin Man. I'm just putting a light coat 
on the inside here, making sure I don't coat the sensor. I don't want the sensor covered in anisees, but I want to keep this, trying to keep it from getting corroded inside of there. And then I'm going to just take a little bit and put it on the surface here as well, because there was corrosion on there that we had to clean off. We'll go ahead and stick our new hub in there. Uh, what's also nice about these hubs, I don't know if they're all this way, but it doesn't appear to be that there's any specific way this has to go in. There's no specific notch or anything. So um, it appears the holes are all equal distance away from each other, so you don't have to make sure it's um, in, the, in the proper spot. So, boy, I don't know. Shim stay or does the shim go? Let's see if it looks like it's a part of the original, the original hub. There's a little shim that was on that axle shaft in there. It fits the new hub. I didn't see any notes about not having to reuse the shim. So I'm going to go ahead and reuse the shim. Just check service information quick. Talks about greasing it up, avoid applying grease to holes and threads, perfect. New torque to yield single use fasteners. All right, I'm reusing the shim. And we'll shove this guy in. And now I'm not gonna co fully complete the repair on camera today, guys. I'll get it tightened down and we'll get it to the point where we can uh, hopefully see uh, a good signal out of this side and then I'll do the right front off or the left front off camera. Oh, does not want to go in. So. That's interesting. Feels very stuck. Maybe just because I was hitting the axle shaft potentially. Let me get the wheel straightened back out so we don't have a kink in the axle shaft. Maybe that'll make it easier. I don't really want to go whaling on the new hub bearing assembly to put this guy in. It's just doesn't sound like it'd be a good plan. Okay, shims in place. Holes are kind of lined up. Now I'm just giving it a light tap. There should be no issue of potentially, I don't know, warping the new hub surface or anything like that. Then what I'm gonna do, start driving our bolts in the backside. So new bolts, again, torque to yield. So we're going to run these things down. The dust shield is okay. The dust shield is perfect. See, you can see on the back side, it's not, not a problem. See, we're not hitting the dust shield. Just spinning the bearing a little bit right now. Wasn't exactly straight for the bolt holes to line up. There we go. And our washer's stuck on the axle shaft. There we go. Oh! Thank you guys, you're the best. 
the backing plate, not to the dust shield. Good call. How many, uh, how many of you have done that before? I have. How many of you put the backing plate or the dust shield or this guy on and uh, put it on backwards? That's happened to me as well. So I did kind of tweak it a little bit when I was pounding it with the hammer, so I'm just going to bend it back. Bend it back straight. Looks good. All right. You guys happy now? Are you happy now? Everybody should be happy now, I think. Thank you for the reminder, by the way, guys. That would have really sucked. <laughs> That's just the fun of it, right? All right, let's try this again. This little shim in here can be a tricky little bugger. It does not like to stay in place. And let's give the Get our threads lined up. Looks good. All right, am I forgetting anything else before I start to run these bolts in? <laughs> you want to hear me cuss, but no. <laughs> yeah, that might have uh, <laughs> might have might have occurred this time. I, I did set out with that goal, guys, that I was not going to cuss this time. So I'm starting uh, starting the bolts by hand, just to make sure I don't cross the thread anything, and then I'll take the take the little impact and and run them down. But I'm not going to run one in all the way, then the other type of thing, because the bearing surface right now isn't it's not flush on the hub, so I don't want to potentially tweak anything. So I'm going to run them down in stages. All right, get my wheel a spin here. Try not to trip over any of my hoses laying on the ground. those two part way out still. Grab the other side. Now I'm dealing with the bolt being stuck on the axle shaft. Does not want to go in its home because the washer does not want to be, doesn't want to go. Just about down. <coughs> now I'm just snugging them, and then we'll do the uh, two, the two torque passes on there. Make sure that we're uh, torquing to yield. So 74 foot-pounds plus 60 to 75 degrees. 
So I'm going to start by putting them all down to 74, all three of them down to 74. Then I'm going to go back and do the, uh, do the degrees, just to make sure that I'm pulling this bearing in all the way straight. It does take a little bit longer to keep, you know, swapping sides of the hub, and I might be able to access all three with it straight. We'll see. All right, so they're all down to 70, uh, 74 foot-pounds, I believe it was. And now we'll set it for angle. And we're looking 60 to 75. I'll pick in the middle. I'll go with 65. I know that's not exactly the middle, but I tend to always give it just a little bit extra at the end. So 65 degrees on top of that. 74. So that was only 35. And we're overcoming my 3 ace torque wrench. It is very upset. Note to self, should have brought digital half inch. So we got about 40 degrees out of that thing. Looks to me like we're going to have to do this by hand. Now, in the case of head bolts, in the case of stuff that's hypercritical on torque angle, you could put a paint mark on the head, measure the degrees, and make sure your paint mark goes to where it's supposed to. Um, we're going to bring it close. So that's about good. Obviously, it's coronavirus. Jeez, you guys. So again, we're going 65. 90 would bring us straight even, so we're going to go, you know, slightly under that. And that is definitely tight. So that's how far we're going. I don't think I've ever uh, been this out of breath on camera before, guys. This is some some good work. We'll hit the last one here. Click, click. Torque to yield. So again, when you're when you're torquing those down, you're actually stretching, stretching the bolt out. Right, we'll get our new axle nut. And now with the axle nut, you have to torque this as well. I'm going to just run it tight for now so we can, uh, so we can run this thing quick and actually see, uh, see what it's doing. And then I'll torque it later. You got to be kidding me. The new axle nut's a different size. Really? Really? Oh, man. That is just, why, why, why would you have to change the axle nut size? What is, what is the benefit? What is the point? Why doesn't it fit a 35 millimeter socket? Why is 36 feels a little loose? It's gonna be loud again. You good? All right. So that was not me just hammering the Ugga Duggas into this axle nut, okay? The reason why I let it hammer is because the nut was still spinning. The socket was still spinning as it was drawing the axle shaft the rest of the way through the hub, okay? It was not me just hammering down in the shaft and not torquing this thing accurately. I ran it until the nut stopped moving. As soon as the nut stops moving, that's when we know the axle shaft itself is seated against the hub assembly, okay? Now we'll have to either support the um, the studs here or have the vehicle on the ground or something like that and we'll take the half inch torque wrench and torque that down to probably somewhere around 200 foot pounds would be my would be my guesstimate on on that spec I haven't looked it up yet but I think we can leave the brakes off we'll leave the rotor off we'll leave the caliper off since I got to put that brake pad back in 
Scope is still hooked up. I think, I think we should be good. Um, this is a, a nut that's got to get peened over. Good, so that was a, a good comment there, Glenn. It's got, <clears throat> it's got notches in there. So you would just take a hammer and you would kind of peen, peen one of these sides over just a little bit. It doesn't have like a notch like on a, you see that a lot on Asian vehicles where they'll actually have a notch in the shaft that you, you uh, peen that over into. There's nothing like that. I think the goal here is just kind of peen the, that end over just to make it contact the threads better. Um, okay, so let's jump over to the scope. Let's reset the scope. Let's bring the vehicle down without crushing the camera. I think we should be fixed. All right, vehicle's almost down. We'll fire this thing up, drop it in drive, and see what our, what our right front is able to output. Oh, gotta be careful pushing the brake pedal when you don't have the uh, brake caliper on. You don't want to uh, force that, that piston out too far and have it go out, out beyond the seals. Well, I think that already looks quite a bit better. Let's uh, just zoom in on it when it's live. So right now the, uh, the right front is spinning quite a bit faster than the left front. It's got no drag on it. There's no brake, uh, brake pads, brake rotor on there, no tire on there to have to uh, control. Um, if both wheels were spinning the same speed, we would see the same uh, the same duty cycle on there. We would see the same amount of traces per second on there. Uh, but we have a consistent, solid, beautiful, happy signal coming out of our right front hub assembly right now. Fixed is fixed. I think we're good to go. Oh, why does the door always lock when you put these things in drive? Oh, that's a safety feature, right? So, I think, uh, I think that does it. Really, I can't say for sure why the hub assembly failed. Is it common for the magnetic encoder ring to fall off the back? Maybe. Is it because somebody beat on the rotors with a hammer to get the old set off? Maybe. Is it just part of a 100,000 mile Chevy Malibu? Maybe. Hard to, hard to say for sure. All I know is that we were able to diagnose it without taking anything apart, without having to pull the hub apart, because the bearing itself, no noise, no issues with the bearing. It wasn't loose. There was no play in it. There were no issues with the bearing itself. It was with the, uh, let's call it the other half of the sensor, the part that the sensor is reading on. That was our issue. So we were able to diagnose that using the scan tool, looking at data, seeing those dropouts, and then just throwing the scope on it quick and taking a look at those values that are coming out of our scope. Uh, we did not see the scope going 0 to 12 volts, so I would be very hesitant I would, if, if you were to ever try it. I would not suggest running the power in from the sensor, shorting that out to ground with a fuse jumper wire. I would not suggest it because this, the computer is not looking for a 12 volt square wave. The voltage was much lower, okay? So I would not suggest doing that. But the moral of the story here is... Maybe it was just rust. Maybe, maybe rust caused this. Maybe it was just part of doing a brake job. Who knows? But this did not, uh, I mean, this entire repair, even with replacing all the bolts and, and the axle, it did not overcome the value of the vehicle like that chain store had told him. This poor guy's been driving over a year with these lights on with something as simple as a wheel bearing replacement. That's really, really all it comes down to. Yes, there was diag involved, but not anything out of the ordinary, not anything longer than your, your typical hour diag, really. This is, uh, this is pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, whew. That was a fun one. That's a fix, I think. I would say, yep, we have confirmed the repair. Uh, Matt, it doesn't need a caliper yet because I didn't push the pedal all the way down. I noticed that it was... Uh, that it was low right away, or that it was, was spongy right away. So I will have to press that caliper back in a little bit to get it back over the rotor. 
but uh, I did not cause the the cup in the caliper to fall out or, or anything like that. Any questions um, in regards to this repair, this, this diagnosis, uh, when it comes to the sensor? And really, bring this up here, guys. Really, all we're doing is, as you can see, as we spin, spin the hub assembly, we're spinning that centerpiece and our sensor. When powered up, powered and grounded, it's just sitting here reading that manipulating, that changing magnetic field. That's all we're doing here. All right. Unfortunately, this seems a bit like a, um, a subpar design. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe the new bearings are redesigned. Who knows? That doesn't seem normal. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> Yeah, maybe I should go to the gym. Um, I don't have any shirts or any GoTech memorabilia to give away today, unfortunately, unless anybody wants some uh, pre-owned Tortilla bolts. That's about all I'd have to give away today, guys. Um, I'm working on, on getting shirts. Um, it'll come up hopefully by the, next, by the next class. Jeremy, we're working on a 14 uh, Malibu but I believe there's gonna be a lot of the GM vehicles in this era that are running this design. Uh, there was, like I said, that TSB. Look up that TSB and you'll see what other vehicles uh, have this same, same design and, and same issues. That TSB number was 17NA047. So that's again for the clicking, ratcheting noise and the, uh, the trouble code um, that this vehicle was setting. But there was nothing stuck to the encoder on the back side of the bearing. Yeah, the encoder just simply was, was, was broken. It was MIA. Uh, dropouts, how would they affect the traction control? Great question, Frank. Um, the dropouts will get noticed by the computer. Um, I'm sure it's got some sort of logic in there saying after a certain amount of time, um, it will set the code. In terms of traction control, I would think that before this thing coded, that it might have engaged traction control or it might have engaged uh, ABS braking just briefly. The customer didn't complain about it at all, so maybe the car is very fast with picking it up. But basically, we were taking a wheel going, what, 15 miles per hour and dropping to zero, uh, and then going back to 15 miles an hour, dropping to zero. So maybe there's some logic involved in that. It's hard to say, hard to know exactly what the uh, EBCM is gonna do at that point. I would be willing to say that these things are smarter than we, we give them credit for because the customer never complained of false activation, never complained of a traction control event or anything like that out of the ordinary. His only complaint was that the vehicle set, set the lights on. There was no, no drivability complaint to go with this. So I would say that the vehicle is, is good enough or fast enough to pick up the failure before it becomes a drivability concern in this application. Um, yeah, I, there are definitely other vehicles out there that are going to run that integrated magnet. Like I showed you guys early on with the press-in bearings, press-in wheel bearings are very common to, um, are very common to require, uh, or, or very common to have that magnetic ring inside. Uh, I did replace with OEM bearings on here at the customer's request. Um, so, uh, Blue Jay Outpost, that's a great question. Is the encoder glued on? Honestly, I don't know the answer to that. It doesn't look like there's any sort of, any sort of glue or, or anything on here, but it has to be stuck on there somehow. I would assume it's not just relying on the magnets to hold it in place. I would assume there's some sort of something holding it in place, uh, but I have, fortunately I have no resource uh, to get that information. We don't actually manufacture hub assemblies here. Uh, we just do the sensors uh, for this vehicle. All right. If there's no other questions, I think we're going to call it for the day. Now, guys, I'm not actually going to be back until April. We're not going to have another live broadcast until April because March is going to be a very, very busy month. Uh, the first week of March is actually the uh, Vision training show down in, uh, in Kansas City. So I'll be there. I think, uh, I think we're leaving here like on Wednesday, and then it runs all the way through the weekend. So if any of you guys are headed out to Vision in Kansas City, make sure to reach out. Be happy to meet up and, uh, I don't know, grab a, a cold beverage or whatever. I feel like I could use a cold beverage after this hub assembly today. 
But uh, yeah, so April, we will be back. I'm not sure exactly of the date yet in April. I don't know if it's going to be the first Thursday or the second Thursday of the month. It'll still be on a Thursday, I can promise you that. But watch for an email to come out. Watch for the uh, live event to be posted out on YouTube for that. So uh, I think with that, we're going we're gonna to head out of here. So um, Cuba, I do not think I'm going to be able to make it to TST this year. Again, March is going to be very busy. I think TST is at the uh, middle to end of March. With going to Vision early in March, I'm not, not going to have time to spend that much time away from home um, in March. So I will... Uh, not be at TST this year. Uh, Jeremy, GoTech, we are a brand of Wells Vehicle Electronics. So we're just a, a sub-brand of Wells Vehicle Electronics, which falls under the NGK Spark Plugs uh, company umbrella. So we, uh, we rebranded just to better represent all of the brands that we support, whether that's NGK or Wells Vehicle Electronics, all right? So really appreciate it, guys. I'll see everybody in April for the next live class. Not sure what it's going to be on yet, but I'm sure it'll be something fun and uh, hopefully something with less possibility of curse words. So I really appreciate you guys being there. Thank you for watching, sticking with this for an hour and a half. I'll see you guys in April and see some of you maybe at Vision. Thank you for watching.